Director of MIT Media Lab, City Science, Ken Larson, MIT City Science Network representatives, distinguished guests, and great friends from all over the world. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Si Hu Wang, President of National Taipei University of Technology, also known as Taipei Tech. On behalf of Taipei Tech, I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to the City Science Summit 2021. It's our great honor to co-host this event with MIT. During this event, leaders across different disciplines gather to share their visions and experience on autonomous mobility, data privacy, informability, and rapid urbanization, and new technology innovations for building a better future city. You will also learn examples and ideas regarding how local solutions can solve global problems. Finally, we are coming all of you to join the 2021 City Science Summit. Special thanks to the great effort of the MIT Media Lab City Science team. I look forward to the success of this event. Thank you. Hello, I am Kent Larson, Director of City Science at the MIT Media Lab. Welcome to our fifth annual City Science Summit that we are calling Cities Within, finding hyper-local solutions within urban communities to address global challenges. Now this is an exciting time to explore new models for cities. Periods of rapid change create opportunities for innovation, and cities are undergoing yet another time of disruption and transformation. 2020 was, in effect, a global experiment that altered patterns of human activity, with an instant reset of working, living, communication, and other behaviors. Many of these changes will probably become permanent. This gives us a great opportunity to come at problems in fresh ways. And there is no greater challenge than global warming. We will never successfully address climate change without rapidly deploying a new model for cities. Let me repeat that. We will never successfully address climate change without rapidly deploying a new model for cities. Now that may sound extreme, but the numbers support this. Cities are responsible for more than 70% of global CO2 emissions, particularly from buildings and transport. But reducing emissions from cities today 
is only part of the challenge because the urban population may almost double by 2050. That will require infrastructure for an additional 2.6 billion people in cities. The old 19th and 20th century models will no longer work for this challenging future. We and others have developed simulation models for pieces of the climate puzzle, but lacking are comprehensive systems to assess possible urban interventions at the community scale. We roughed out such a platform for this summit. Let me step you through a study of the MIT Kendall Square District. Let's start with a percentage of electric vehicles. Dialing this all the way up to 100% results in a relatively minor improvement given the embodied energy of the chassis, body, batteries, and electronics, and the fact that electricity is delivered uh, to this area mostly generated from fossil fuel. A much more dramatic improvement is seen when we achieve live-work symmetry, that is, opportunities for people who work in the district to also live within walking and biking distance. Then a transition to ultralight mobility and package delivery. This has improved even more if public policy creates incentives for schools and shopping, recreation, and cultural venues to be located in close proximity in each community, we see an even greater improvement since people use fewer mechanized mobility modes. When we create compact, transformable housing that occupies 60% less space than conventional housing, but with greater functionality, cutting in half the embodied and use energy for each apartment. And finally, the transition to local production of food and other resources makes even more progress. If we could transform communities across the globe in such a manner, we could make great progress on the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Certainly we help meet SDG goal number three, good health and well-being, by creating compact, walkable, and bikeable communities encouraging physical activity. We help hit six with distributed water purification and sanitation, seven with local energy production and microgrids, eight with more entrepreneurial communities, nine with resilient distributed infrastructure, 10 with equitable access to affordable housing and local resources. Now goal 11 is what all of the other goals should contribute to. The city as a network of resilient, high-performance, connected communities. Deploying lightweight mobility and local food production will get us a long ways towards SDG goal number 12. And the dramatic CO2 reduction from all of the above will help achieve 13. Sustainable coastal communities will help with 14. And compact, higher density cities will minimize sprawl and deforestation. Finally, we help with 16 by creating strong community social ties and innovative local governance. We're just getting started with this model and all of the interventions that this simulates. Many of these ideas will be explored in the summit workshops, and I hope that you will join us on this journey. Thank you. El Instituto Cultural Universitario es un proyecto central para la Universidad de Guadalajara mismo que incluirá actividades de los distintos centros universitarios, centros de arte y esparcimiento, parques, museos, transporte público, así como áreas deportivas y residenciales. En él se pretende desarrollar un hub de innovación que, a diferencia de proyectos similares que generan segregación, busca ser incluyente, armónico y sustentable, y está considerado como el primero en su tipo en todo México. A partir de que iniciamos esta colaboración con el MIT, empezamos a trabajar aquí en la comunidad de Lomas del Centinela, en el municipio de Zapopan. En estas periferias empezamos a diagnosticar pues, las necesidades de la comunidad en torno a carencias de agua, energía, seguridad y medio ambiente. También estamos transformando la imagen urbana con el paisaje derivado del Museo de Ciencias Ambientales que va a tener una de las azoteas o la azotea más biodiversa del mundo, con cerca de 400 especies. También hay una participación social activa de la comunidad, haciendo desde murales, trabajos de cuidado ambiental, aprovechando el jardín educativo, de manera que estamos generando una sinergia entre el arte y la economía. El Museo de Ciencias Ambientales, desde su concepción original, está enfocado al mejoramiento de comunidades que tienen 
un nivel bajo de desarrollo económico. La participación, el codiseño y el trabajo concreto en las comunidades yo creo que son los tres elementos fundamentales de, de la filosofía del museo. En el Distrito Cultural Universitario se han desarrollado básicamente tres zonificaciones. La parte educativa, que está al norte de la segunda, que se llama Centro Cultural Universitario. Y la tercera es precisamente la intervención en edificios por parte del sector social y del sector privado, en donde habrá vivienda, comercio y parques. Este laboratorio en particular se enfoca en las dinámicas y los problemas de la urbanización rápida, como son la generación de estos asentamientos informales y precarios. Se tienen dos años trabajando con la comunidad de Lomas del Centinela, que es una comunidad considerada como un entorno sensible, ya que existen diferentes tipos de problemas, tanto de infraestructura como problemas sociales. Y lo que hemos logrado ha sido la idea de reconocer las capacidades que tienen. Ha sido el caso de, de que logramos juntos construir diferentes tipos, por ejemplo, huertos, como es el caso de estos huertos Quijol. Uno de los problemas más comunes que hemos encontrado en esa comunidad es el energético donde tenemos problemáticas en la iluminación de las calles donde o es nula o deficiente. Por tanto, la solución que se le debe de dar a este tipo de espacios tiene que ser bien identificada y de una manera sustentable. El CityScope se está desarrollando para la escala del Distrito Cultural Universitario, que incluye una superficie de aproximadamente 400 hectáreas con predios públicos, privados y de la universidad en donde estamos incorporando los diagnósticos de las comunidades del entorno, que muchas de ellas se encuentran en condiciones de marginalidad, e incorporando temas de acceso a la movilidad, a servicios, a la infraestructura, empleos y tipología de vivienda, como sería la vivienda en renta para estudiantes. En el Laboratorio de Ciencia de la Ciudad, con sede en Guadalajara, buscamos aportar a los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible, principalmente el objetivo número 4, Educación de Calidad, generando espacios y talleres para las comunidades. En el objetivo número 10, la reducción de desigualdades, así como el objetivo número 11, Ciudades y Comunidades Sustentables. Con esta colaboración que nos une a la Red Internacional de Laboratorios en Ciencias de la Ciudad, se buscará desarrollar tecnología emergente de bajo costo para contribuir al mejoramiento de las condiciones de habitabilidad, saneamiento, movilidad, consumo energético en estas comunidades. Estamos iniciando el programa de capacitación y fortalecimiento de habilidades para el mejoramiento de comunidades. Esto permitirá a las personas que ya desempeñan un oficio y no tuvieron acceso a la universidad puedan contar con un reconocimiento oficial que avale su conocimiento adquirido por la experiencia y puede insertarse en el mercado formal. Con estas acciones, estamos aportando a los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible y la nueva Agenda Urbana Global. Dear guests of the City Science Summit 2021, this is Professor Lo Yongqi, the Vice President of Kangji University. My topic today will be community building within neighborhood, a post-COVID perspective. Human activity in pursuit of economic development and growth has pushed the human world beyond the safety zone. That's the reason why SDGs now become our common goals and why we focus on the topic of designing for SDGs in this year's City Science Summit. Scientists may point out environmental effects, but the human causes remain under the surface. Every single sustainable problem relates to our ways of living, producing, and satisfying our needs for health, food, housing, sanitation, education, and maybe most important of all, a meaningful existence. A transition towards sustainability is a process of a collective social changes. The Chinese term of design in Shiji means setting up a strategy 
With expanding of design from form given to complex socio-technical system level solution, design has its significance in dealing with both top-down and bottom-up, and the combination of the two. We need to develop a new design culture for sustainable transition, a typical example of a complex socio-technical challenge. The Design X Manifesto in 2014 at Technology University is one of these attempts. How to take the universities and colleges as innovation sources and the living laboratories of sustainable social changes will be a promising solution. Since 2015, the College of Design and Innovation of Tongji has gradually launched the NICE 2035 project. NICE means Neighborhood of Innovation, Creativity, and Entrepreneurship. We established a service of multifunction laboratories scattered in the neighborhood community. Many labs are the joint efforts with industries, such as Circular Economy Lab with Apta, Shared Kitchen Lab with Hire, Drinking Water Design Innovation Lab with Angel, Future Mobility Lab with Austin Martin, etc. etc. Tongji MIT City Science Lab, which is renovated from a waste station, is also among them. These labs explore various future living scenarios, such as neighborhood-based distributed business services, shared office, shared kitchen, extra small residential space, research labs, incubators, and maker space in the community. A series of well-designed scenarios of a high quality of life next door to the apartment blur the functional zoning of living, working, and entertainment, reduce traffic, and greatly reduce carbon emissions. The team of uh, City Science Lab of Tangji and MIT is now developing a data-driven simulation and evaluation system to visualize these impacts. For instance, carbon emission contribution of this kind of a decentralized solution. Of course, our story goes beyond the technical facts, shared empathy and understanding across different sectors. The raising attention, better service of the community, diversified ecosystem, affordable housing solution for the use are all the result of this experiment. Most important, a community of choices, both in virtual and the real world, has been built. Our ultimate goal is to try to transform the urban community from a space merely for living into an incubator of a sustainable ways of living and the new source of urban innovation towards SDGs. At the end of 2020, the British Design Museum published a book called A Plan for Future Observatory, which selected the NICE 2035 as one of the 10 cases to reveal the transformation trend in the post-pandemic era. We all hope that this year will be the year for human beings to restart after the COVID-19. But if the restarted world is still the same as before, we will lose the opportunity for transformation at the cost of so many lives and global economic and social succession. Thanks all for your attention and thanks Professor Yao, Kent, and all the members of City Science Network to make this conference possible. I wish the City Science Summit 2021 a great success. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Mark. I'm the director of Andorra Research and Innovation, the City Science Lab uh, here in Andorra, the network. And I would like to talk about consensus and how consensus is important to really take action and having the climate change as an example. Climate change is one of the most important challenges, if not the most important one uh, that the society is facing and will face in the coming years. So there is a strong scientific consensus about the anthropogenic, uh, the human caused climate change. So the evidence is, is there and the awareness of the society and the citizens is increasing more and more. So we know already what are the local and the global impacts that we'll have climate change in the future and even the crisis of the COVID has put uh, in front so how a global threat like like the COVID uh, should be or could be only one small piece of what are we facing or will face in, in, in the coming decades. So the SDG uh, framework so has identified also climate action 
as one of the, the main goal targets and, and those targets and uh, goals ha have been really well identified, like strike, make uh, increasing this resilience and the, capa the adaptive capacity of, of the communities to really integrate climate change in any measure and policy, uh, both at local, national and, and international levels. But if we really analyze how we are performing in terms of response, we see that there is really, really a lack between this knowledge and our action. So if we take the city science processes that we have been discussing in, in, in precedent uh, city science summits, where we have these six phases, now the insight, transformation, prediction, deployment, consensus and governance, we can see that in the first three stages, what is about the, having insight about the problem, uh, better understand how we can transform or, or change these dynamics or even predict how our trends or uh, should be in a future or how if we act now, can we change these dynamics? are quite well known, so we, as I was saying, so that the scientific knowledge as well as the, the awareness of the citizens is quite aligned and we really have a strong set of, of, of responses that we could start to do in the coming years, both at technical, technological, societal, or even in terms of policies, we see that in terms of deployment, in terms of consensus, how to act and even governance, we are really, really, really far from, from how we should be acting right now. And even we can say that we are uh, being late in, in responding to, to climate change. One of the main lines of work in our institution is uh, really to try to reduce this gap between this knowledge and this uh, awareness of the society with this lack of action and lack of response. And nowadays, for example, and this is this will be the topic that we will discuss in our in our workshop this year is how we, for example, could mix two different frameworks like are the the living lab labs approach and the man and biosphere reserve framework from the UNESCO and how can these two different frameworks really help to try to co-create and design these, these potential solutions and also with a dynamic loop of prototyping, revising and assessing the, the impacts, but also with this constant dialogue with the different stakeholders, the community and trying to establish this uh, commitments uh, of, of, of all the different actors in, in our community, in our case, in our country, and see how these frameworks and these tools that we are developing really could help to, to deploy a, a, a dynamic, a continuous process of, of adapting and change and give response to, to, for example, climate change, but in general to, to become a more resilient uh, and sustainable community. Frameworks and these tools will be a key element to really have this dialogue and this uh, co-creation of solutions in order to reach this consensus of what should be the hyperlocal solutions to these uh, global problems or challenges. Hi, my name is Gesa Zimmer. I'm the director of the City Science Lab in Hamburg. And as you see here, I'm at the construction site of our new City Science Lab. I would like to speak about collaboration because what we do in Hamburg here is a lot that we are trying to foster or that we are trying to support collaboration between different stakeholders. So we call it a multi-stakeholder collaboration research area. So we try to bring people together to speak about future city scenarios. And um, yeah, as we all know, there are a lot of uh, challenges in the world that we have to address at the moment. I would like to mention two uh, major challenges. One is, of course, democracy. I mean, we have to, we have to keep or we have to um, take care of our democracy because there's a lot of populism going on. On the other side, which is the negative side, the positive side is that there's also a lot of active civil society at the moment that want to have a say, that want to have a stake. So um, we do work
work on a very local level here in Hamburg, and we also work on a very international level. And when you look at cities from a global perspective, of course, we have different situations. We have some cities or regions that have a lot of data, that have a lot of very, very good um, technical infrastructure. Then we come to other cities, there is a huge lack of data, especially of social data. We have a lot of data about mobility, about logistics and all those technical data, but social data is sometimes very weak and we think here in Hamburg that this is very important too. And then you come to other regions and cities and you see that there is, there is data, but those data is unconnected. So we are also setting up a lot of urban data hubs, a lot of urban data management systems. So uh, we have to take into account that there is a digital divide going on in the world. So we do also work with the United Nations and uh, we are trying, of course, to follow the SDGs, mainly SDG number 11, which is sustainable cities and regions. And um, yeah, we are trying to um, to work against social inequity, and this is also a data issue. It's not only an issue about poverty, water access, and so on and so on. It's also an issue about who has access to what kind of data. So what do we do when we uh, try to um, foster collaboration? We do it at many different ways. So one is that we are setting up decision support systems. We call it like this, which means that you can make um, a decision in city planning transparent, and that makes it much easier because a lot of um, decisions in city planning are compromises and it makes it much more much easier for citizens and also for stakeholders for experts to understand why this decision has been made then of course we collaborate we co collaborate in data production so people have sensors there's a lot of collaborative data production going on and mapping mapping is also very important in the context of the United Nations because when you go to informal settlements there is a lot of unmapped society so we don't have data actually we don't know how old those people are how many people do live in an informal settlement so mapping alternative mapping is very important for for us and it's a, it's a very collaborative thing in the end then of course we as we are also architects here in our lab uh, we like a collaborative designing so collaboratively drafting new spaces in the city like public spaces or also buildings and this is very creative and we also use um, virtual reality augmented reality to help people to imagine the city in a different way so um, creating utopias of cities, of other cities, especially post-corona cities, is something that is very important for us. Yeah, and then, of course, it's, it's a lot also about uh, co-managing a city because we also try to influence governance processes in the city with our tools so that they are more transparent and more, more collaborative. So this is actually what we do here in Hamburg. So um, fostering collaboration, supporting collaboration with a lot of data. Also, uh, we are fighting, let's say, for uh, having transparency laws, having open data policies. This is very important for cities because we think that it's not good if they depend on companies. We, of course, collaborate with companies a lot, but we also like to have the city as being a kind of independent data space where we can use data and make them accessible for people. On April 22, 2021, the City Science Lab at Ho Chi Minh City was inaugurated. This was a joint effort between Vietnam Ho Chi Minh City Department of Planning and Architecture, the Architecture Research Center, ARC, Sunny World Development and Management, SDMC, ISCM, UIT, MM Lab, V Lab from Vietnam, and the City Science Group at MIT Media Lab. Today, a diverse intern institutional an interdisciplinary team of researchers from the six institutions are working together to find local solutions for global challenges. Right after the opening, this diverse team started one of the most active, rapid, and creative collaborations of the entire City Science Network. Due to the challenge of the pandemic, the City Science Lab at Ho Chi Minh City participated in the redesign of the entire city scope platform, so if that could be deployed long distance without the physical help of the city science group. In order to do that, an innovative, tangible interaction has been developed. 
so transparent 3D printed models can be used as interactive tools. In parallel, three urban scenarios have been analyzed in order to understand how new urban developments could affect the urban sustainability of District 4 in Ho Chi Minh City. In order to achieve this goal, the MIT Media Lab City Science Group has transferred the city scope knowledge to the Vietnam team in a series of city scope workshops. Thanks to the great work developed by the teams involved in the project on July 7, 2021, less than three months before the opening, the tangible city scope table was deployed in our lab. In parallel, a replica of the table has developed at MIT so that research can be conducted in parallel by both teams. Our lab has developed in collaboration with MIT its own version of the city scope front end. As well as a research exploration, the combined team of the City Science Lab at Ho Chi Minh City and the MIT Media Lab City Science Group has developed a set of metrics to measure the urban impacts for three different scenarios in District 4. The indicators are density of housing, amenities, and employment, diversity of housing, amenities, and employment, balance of housing, amenities, and employment, accessibility to parks, medical service, commercial service, and education, live work symmetry, and mobility energy consumption. Currently, District 4 is a historical district and the existing population has an acceptable diversity level in relation to housing and employment. It also has a good performance in terms of housing density. However, the district had a low employment density and a low density of amenities, which is impacting the live work symmetry among other things. The proposal accepted by the Ho Chi Minh City government in 2014 improved the level of amenities and housing density. Unfortunately, these proposals do not solve the challenge of employment density, nor does it improve the live work symmetry. It also has a negative impact on the mobility energy consumption. If we view an utopian scenario where we are only developing the waterfront of District 4, a very small park cell comparison with the entire district, we can already see how this autonomous, resilient waterfront is already improving the level of employment, amenities and housing density, as well as reducing traffic congestion, which helps to increase the live work symmetry indicator of the district. This video has shown a very high level overview of the work that has been done during the first four months of our collaboration between our lab at Ho Chi Minh City and the City Science Group at MIT Media Lab. We are excited about the potential that this collaboration has in future challenges to come. Welcome to the City Science Summit 2021. My name is Hossein Ranema. I'm a visiting professor at MIT Media Lab and an associate professor at Ryerson University in Toronto. Our interest is to see how can we make data more creative. So we bring this interdisciplinary view around data in our lab and in our research groups. We have a course called the Super Course Program that we bring students from performance, arts, fashion, mechanical engineering, and computer science all together. We create interdisciplinary groups from them on a semester basis, and we provide them with the tools that we created and allowing them to apply it to different aspects of a city living. And this allows us to understand the impact and scale of the research that we are doing across the city of Toronto. I'd like to share some examples with you. Uh, 
we are now working on a unique project that allows us to store community level data at the community. We are not going to centralize that data in a non-transparent cloud, but we allow citizens and members of the community to have a say in terms of how they wanna store the data, how they wanna share the data, the data, and what they wanna do with it. Not even we use this data sharing to understand the health metrics of a community, such as access to green space, uh, healthcare, uh, density, or access to public transport, but we are also observing that we can provide effective inter-community collaboration between communities in the city of Toronto. And then we include authorities such as tax authorities and municipal authorities to come up with new incentive models and policies. So on a collective basis, communities across Toronto can thrive and become better. We have now created community models for the city of Toronto, allowing different communities to share each other's knowledge base to understand the performance of their K-12 uh, schools. We are also allowing different universities and different members of the communities, even celebrities, to apply their knowledge base with the community and applying that knowledge base on food ordering gaps on navigational tools, and this allows us to decentralize those capabilities and allowing each community to create the type of intelligence that they want and how they want to do it. So if I really want to summarize what our team does, I can summarize it into six key pillars. We are very interested in how can we make cities more persuasive and allowing people to interact with digital services more effectively. We are interested in understanding the knowledge flow and the network effects that we can create and look at the societal model of communities using data. Of course, we are also interested in how can such data be accessible and by whom and using what type of legal contracts and how such complicated language can be, become more transparent and more understood by different members of the community. We are doing a lot of work to also understand how innovation can happen in a more decentralized fashion. Another very interesting area for us in collaboration with the, with the Media Lab is to also look at this notion of adaptive zoning. We are working with large companies in Canada now that the expectation of their employees is to also have a daycare at the office well, what's gonna happen to zoning? What's gonna happen to tax? What's gonna happen to liabilities? Can we use algorithms to address some of that for us and making zoning more adaptive? And the last thing that we are working on is also understand the new metrics of productivity, not just for businesses, but also understanding community productivity in which data is a fabric allowing us to understand that. If you're interested in any of the areas that I talked about, I would love to talk to you during the course of the summit. My colleagues will be there, I will be there, and we really hope that you enjoy the next few days uh, collaborating with us. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. My name is Richard Yao. I'm the director of City Science Lab Taipei Tech. It is my great pleasure to co-host this event. And today, I'm going to introduce you three agents. Those three agents can be easily distributed around the city with the mission to help us monitor the city, bring convenience to our lives, and shape a sustainable future. The first agent is urban sensing agent that could help us monitor the, our city. It combines drone technology, sensing, and simulation. This agent is able to track the environmental data and help us visualize the heat island effect. Through science, education, and experiments, Taipei Tech focuses on how the urban thermal environment impacts people's life. The agent helps monitor the building's reactive cooling effect. 
This agent could calculate the urban wind field at different heights using sensors that collect the environmental data. We map neighborhood by neighborhood and aggregate this data together. The techniques also include measuring the thermal performance of asphalt and sensors that drone could carry. This agent collects temperature, humidity, atmospheric pressure, and wind velocity. We then put the collected spatial data into a visualization agent that generates high-resolution three-dimensional representation of the ur urban heat island effect. The second agent is charging robot that could charge our e-scooter autonomously. We know policymakers around the world are taking progressive actions to remove gasoline vehicles from the streets. So we are going to design a charging robot to increase the charging utilization rate and maximize the availability of parking space. When your battery is running low or parked at parking lot, you can simply connect a cable to your scooter. By scanning the QR code on the charging post, you can summon a charging robot agent to charge your e-scooter. Navigating in the parking space could be complex due to speed differences of scooters, people, and other objects. It is crucial for the robot to dynamically plan a new path to avoid collisions. The agent can connect to the charging pole precisely using visual servoing technique which is a combination of image processing and control theory. When your scooter is fully charged, the robot will automatically disconnect and move to serve the subsequent charging request. The third agent is delivery robot that could provide us on-demand delivery service. We know taking customers' online order and delivering those order objects to cut to them is getting popular and popular. It is especially true during the pandemic. Based on this concept, we are going to design a delivery robot to do the delivery chore for us. This agent provides on-demand door-to-door delivery service and can operate across different buildings. The agent understands its location by comparing the real-time LiDAR scanning signal with high-resolution 3D map of the environment. Using a simple app interface, users can make delivery requests and the agent will arrive at a designated location. A built-in storage compartment will secure your package safely. When the robot begins the delivery service, the package recipient will receive an unique QR code for receiving the package from the storage compartment. Once the robot arrives at the destination, the recipient can use the QR code they have received earlier to retrieve the package. The demonstration you have just seen are simply the examples showing how those three agents could bring convenience to our lives. If you are interested, I would like to invite you to join our workshop on this Friday so that we could uh, brainstorm, do brainstorming together to see how we can echo SDG with those three agents. See you then. I'm here with Deva Newman, the new director of the MIT Media Lab. Welcome Thank to you. our fifth annual City Science Summit that we call Cities Within. So first of all, what do you see as unique and interesting to you about the Media Lab? Oh, thanks, Ken. I'm so glad to be here. The Media Lab, what drew me in is, uh, I think it's just the most creative, uh, multi-inter-transdisciplinary lab at MIT and then people are pretty action-oriented, so we want to be also offering up solutions to, to everyone and with everyone, with, with your work especially, it's the co-creating. Mm -hmm. With respect to your own personal research interests, what are you most passionate about? Right now, personally, in terms of research, as you might know, I'm a rocket scientist, so I've always been thinking literally about moonshots and getting humanity to become 
interplanetary. What does that mean? We are going to have humanity going to the moon and Mars. I really have to say the most important thing I can be thinking about is climate and living in balance and harmony with all of humanity. Hmm. Uh, we're all astronauts because we all live on this spaceship together. So right now, thinking a lot about climate and sustainability. Yeah. You know, cities account for something like 70% of the CO2 emissions on the planet. In fact, I have come to believe that we will not address climate change unless we find a new model for cities. I wonder if you agree with that. I do, because you've, you've taught me well, but I love uh, you know, how you title it, cities within. Yeah. So it really is thinking about within our urban environments, and if there's a billion people now, and that climbs to 3.5 billion, then that's a game changer. Yeah. Well, then this has to be the key to climate. We are probably at a tipping point. How do we reduce emissions? How do we worry still about quality of life, access, all these things? And um, well, we can do that within cities. That's, that's what I'm so excited about. We'll need uh, to change behavior, yeah. but then we need new creative technologies and solutions, you know, systems solutions. Climate is a really complex systems yes. problem. It's really complex, so no silver bullets, yeah. but what's the right mix? So it seems like a really big challenge. <laughs> <laughs> People get overwhelmed, I know, yeah. but what you're doing is so fantastic because you're offering solutions, co-created. People can move the knobs and dials and say, oh, if we do this, here's the change. If I can do this. So I think that's really empowering. Yeah, though I think that that's exactly right. I mean, people do get really overwhelmed. But I, yeah, I think there are things that people can do in their local community that if scaled globally could make a big difference. Yeah, I think that's where we start. Your idea is about in the community, give people, empower people. Hey, they can do it in Cambridge, Mass, but where else? Good, they can do it in Shanghai, right? Can we do it in Bangkok? See really good examples, and that's another way to really scale it. Mm. Let's talk about one detail. So top priority of the current administration is a transition to electric vehicles. There's another alternative, which is to get rid of commuting. I yeah. love the idea. No one probably really wants to commute. So if you have the services and you can walk to work or bike to work, that is so convenient. And it also, it's a much more social. It is a changing human behavior, but all for the positive and the benefits are for quality of life really increases, mm. you know, living in the village community, a real community. Mm. And I think we have lost that sense of community and I can't wait to get it back. Well, building housing for faculty and students and staff on or near campus is not a priority for MIT. Do you think it should be? Absolutely. I and mean, I love to envision a state where our community, our academic community, that we could be co-located. But boy, to pull in researchers and staff and faculty and everyone, that would be something, because that would be the entire community would uh, really thrive, I believe. Well, climate, back to climate, it's, it's, what do you think is the Media Lab's unique contribution to climate research? I've been thinking about that recently, so what can the Media Lab do? For the Media Lab specifically, I love uh, you know, our idea of the hyper-local, and we have to have the global holistic perspective to say we're all on this spaceship together, we're all crew, mm -hmm. you know, my crewmate is, is you, my crewmate is in Asia, my crewmate is in Europe. But then when the work gets done, I love, uh, again, kind of your idea and articulation of the hyper-local. I think we have this decade to try to mm. get this right. Then 10 years hence, we'll say, yeah, we got, we got that right. You know, we moved the needle. We brought the communities together. We looked within and came up with some of these solutions. So I hope that's, on, that's the journey that we're on. Exciting. Yeah. Thank you, David. Oh, thank you.